Good morning, everyone. This is KNES 415 Biomechanics. Uh, just to make sure you're at the right video. Uh, housekeeping. So we just got a, um, last night, uh, we just got a, an email from the university uh, that they have decided that we're going to do the honor system whatever that means, uh, for, uh, for grades. So basically you guys would decide based on your past performance or what you projected, uh, what your grade should be. So, uh, you guys can actually pick your grades. April fools. Ah, ah. Sorry. So getting right into it, I'm testing out a new system of delivery for the lecture. I stole my son's headset. He, he's a gamer uh, and it's super early in the morning, so uh, he won't miss it. He could he's like really addicted to it. So I'm sure he could like sense a disturbance in the force if I tried to use it uh, while he was awake. So shh, don't tell him. All right, so I got uh, uh, some pretty good feedback, man, from the last video that uh, I'm making physics uh, easy to learn. Uh, keep in mind, you know, this isn't an intro physics class. Uh, we're going to get it. There's going to be some things that I assume you guys know about trigonometry so that we can push forward ahead. However, it's important that we're all on the same page of what we call things. So that's why I'm kind of uh, going through some of these things. Uh, so what I have up here, all right, uh, what I want to be clear about is kinematic terms. And the reason I want to be clear on kinematic terms is, is that sugar, you know me and my analogies, sugar is just a thing and used in the right ingredients with other things you can a cake, you can make brownies, you can make some, or you can burn, make a bad set of brownies. Uh, but the point is, is that sugar is just an ingredient and a cake is one thing. You know, if I say cake, you know what that means, but the cake is made up of a lot of different things. And some of those things are in steps, right? A process. First you do this, then you take that then you add it together. And some of these higher end kinematic terms like acceleration that's kind of how that word is it's a thing but it's made of a recipe of other things and there's a central ingredient that comes with any good cake yummy cake some sugar so um, what i'm going to do with this is to teach you how acceleration is really made up of a central ingredient and that's position Okay, so let's take a look at this little kinematic chart uh, that I spared no expense uh, making for you guys. Okay, so this is just to clarify position, little p, where are you at? And when I say you, it could be any object. Uh, where is the eraser at? Where is the baseball at? Where is the car at? So it's just the position of whatever object um, you're looking at. Okay, uh, we're going to use our analogy from last class with the 40-yard uh, dash, okay, or the four, or the 100-meter dash, whatever sprint you want to use as an analogy. Where are you at starting line, okay? Now, delta P, change. Delta means change, uh, which is kind of our, uh, appropriate for like Delta Airlines, changes your position, okay? I know it was made in the Delta of the South, but just it's kind of cool. Delta Airlines changes your position. Change in position is Delta P. Now, some of you may be remit. Does that is that the same thing as uh, PF minus PI? Yeah, because wherever you end, you got to subtract wherever you started, and that's your change, right? So that's the same thing. Delta change is the F minus the I, final minus initial. Okay, so. Delta P, another word of saying this, okay? So this is a, a, a kinematic concept position. Change in position gets its own name, and that's distance or displacement. 
scalar vector. How far did you go as the crow flies? In other words, it doesn't matter if you take the winding path. How far you went is going to take into account all the curves. Your displacement is how far did you go in a certain direction? How far did you go south? So in other words, it doesn't matter that it was winding. How far did you go south? Okay. Here's the other example of the football player. Football player might run zigzag, but he only gets credit for a displacement. How far did he go in a certain direction? So in other words, capital D, direction matters. So the point is, is that these two concepts have some of this in it, right? Distance is delta P, and displacement is delta P when direction matters. All right, let's add another term in here, time. What is time? You can get into some real deep thought contemplating what time is. And basically, it is a unit of measure to separate events or to give relative place to events. Um, so time is what we use to separate actual events in order of their occurrence. Okay, So time is little t. So we can ask ourselves for the 40-yard dash, for instance, okay, a, a speed test that we only report in time. Remember that from the last lecture? So we could basically ask ourselves this question. What is the point of a 40-yard dash if all we ever do is talk about its displacement? Because remember, 40-yard dash is kind of a displacement because it doesn't matter if the, if the test is set up like this and you run 40 yards like this, the clock ain't ever going to stop. So direction kind of matters with a speed race, right? You better run in the right way to get counted. So the point is, is that what's the purpose of a speed test if, if we stop the measure here? Like, let me give you a silly example. Let's pretend uh, two people were discussing, um, let's say two people were discussing their track uh, prowess, right? But they were only talking about distance. And they were like, uh, hey, did you run the 40-yard uh, dash speed test yesterday? And they're like, yeah, sure did. They were like, how'd you do? I finished it. Ran all 40 yards. In other words, if all you did was end it on distance or displacement, it, unless you pulled a hamstring or unless you just stopped, everybody would be the same. Everybody would have the same. So how do you separate things? How do you organize them where they did it differently? You ask yourself, well, how much time? Ah, you trickster. Yeah, of course you finished it. But how much time did it take you to finish it? Okay, the arrow of time. So what basically you did is, is you added an ingredient to the recipe. So you started off with sugar position, and then you did something with that change in position to get this new concept of distance displacement, and then you add this new ingredient of time. You make it relative, okay? Well, yeah, smart butt. Sure, you ran 40 yards, but how much time did it take you to run 40 yards? So I want you to notice that this is the same thing as that. Delta P over T is the same thing as D over T, and little d over T is speed, and big D over T is displacement. Again, direction matters, okay? Symbols is kind of freaky. Uh, velocity is bold V and uh, speed is like italicized V, okay? So you see how we're, we're, we're working this recipe. We're working ourselves and, hey, well, what about this? What about this? We had some of this. We had some of this. How fast you're going. Now, the last one, the next jump is... Imagine two people are talking about their cars, right? And let's say they both have two uh, sports cars, and they can go real fast. And all they did was brag about their cars in terms of, like, at, like how fast can they go. So person number one is like, well, my car could go 100 miles an hour. And person number two is like, well, my car can go 100 miles an hour. So how do they separate 
kind of some kinematic uh, concepts there. Well, how much time did it take you to get to 100 miles an hour? We used time again. Again, now we've already used it once miles in one hour distance in regard to time that's a speed speed concept a speed term so how much time it took you to go from zero to a hundred now if you think about it zero to a hundred is a change in speed in or when direction matters a change in velocity so there's a delta there, right? Delta V, change in velocity. Now, again, those two people could both go from zero to 100. Big whoop. How do you know who's better? How much time did it take you to go from zero to 100? How much time did it take you to speed up? And sometimes you got to slam on the brakes. How much time did it take you to slow down? Delta V over T is what acceleration is. That is the definition of acceleration. If you think about it, we could write it another way. Delta P over T in regard to another T. In other words, we've used time twice. We used it for velocity, and then we used it for acceleration. That's why the units of meters per second squared, that's why it's squared because we use time twice in the recipe for acceleration, okay? So this hopefully can be some use. Now, let me get to the bottom line with acceleration. And this is, this is important because it's easy to play fast and loose with kinematic terms. It really is. It, you know, it, anytime you ever watch any sporting event, the announcer is playing super fast and loose with kinematic terms, you know? Speed, acceleration, power, that, uh, running backs running with great acceleration speeds all the time. If we, I say assume, if we inferred that the 40-yard dash is a speed test, even though it's reported in time, and remember how I said last lecture, we use physics all the time, but we don't give ourselves credit. Everybody displaces the same, so variations in time is going to mean variations in speed. Same thing with acceleration. If you change velocity, direction matters. If you change velocity, acceleration is a, is a, uh, is a vector, okay? And the reason it's a vector is because forces and accelerations are related to each other. And because forces are vectors, that means accelerations have to be vectors. Meaning that, remember with the chair example, that X force across can't make cha can't change the chair's direction a um, uh, motion up down right only X forces can be responsible for changes in X movement and only Y forces can be responsible for changes in Y motion so that's why acceleration is a vector quantity because it's related to forces we're going to get into that in Newton's second law but the point is of this is think about acceleration as how much time does it take anything to speed up or slow down? Meaning that if you change speed, think about it on your car, right? If you're at a stop sign and your velocity is zero, zero is a number, guys, and you hit the speeder upper pedal and you go from zero to 40, let's say the speed limit is 40 and you're good drivers and you don't go one mile an hour over there was a change there you went from this to that you had a final minus an initial so you had a change in velocity you had a delta v and it took time to do that how much time did it take you now you know darn well you know this physics if you went from zero to 40 in a little bit of time you'd have to punch it and you would feel a great force speeding you up at a great rate that's a bigger acceleration than if you went from zero to 40 in bigger amounts of time more time gradually going from zero to 40 right 
it's a, less force would be pushing you. And so, so think about that with accelerations and forces. Now, the point is, is that we can infer acceleration just like we inferred speed because anything with mass, anything with stuff, exhibit A, well, you drew a little smiley face, exhibit B, exhibit C. I wish I had a cat. I'd lift up the cat right here. Everything with mass takes time to speed up and to slow down. Even though our eyes may not process it, in other words, it may be faster than what our eyes could process, everything takes time. So if you think about a baseball player hitting a ball, and it seems like the ball is traveling this way and then traveling the opposite direction, it has velocity coming here, then it has velocity going there, to our eyes, it seems instantaneously. It seems like it took zero time. That's not the reality. Everything with mass takes time to speed up or to slow down. What's really happening is the speeding up and the slowing down is faster than what our little eyes can process. Our eyes and our brains have fixed cameras that don't really process a, a very high brain. What's really happening in to the back? And if we slowed it down in super slow motion, which we can do now, we have the technology, the ball is being compressed into the bat as it slows down. So if you had a still picture of a ball in a bat, it would be like squished in. So the ball compresses into the bat as it slows down and then leaps off of the bat like a bullfrog leaping from the ground as it speeds up the other way. So the reality is, is the ball slows down in one direction and then speeds up in the other, change in velocity. And everything takes time. So you can imagine if it changed that velocity and you couldn't even see it, it had to be a very small fractions of a second to do it. That infers that it had to have great acceleration. Remember with velocity, the smaller the time, the greater your velocity. It's the same thing with acceleration. The smaller the time, the less time it takes you to change your velocity, the greater the acceleration. And what I'm going to show you with Newton's second law is that force and acceleration are directly proportional. As one goes up, this goes up. F is equal to ma. So for great accelerations, you need great forces. And you could feel that, right? When you punch it on your speed or upper pedal, you feel the car pushing you with more force than if you graduate. Now, why do I say speed or upper pedal? Newton, his equation, if you remember from physics, is F is equal to MA. Acceleration is a vector quantity. Acceleration does not mean to speed up. Whoa. It, you can speed up, but acceleration just means change in velocity of any object. Oh, and guess what? Everything takes time. So we infer time. So we can just talk about acceleration in terms of getting faster, getting slower, speeding up, slowing down. And because everything with mass takes time to do so, we can infer that it took time. Now, Newton said F is equal to MA. Newton did not say F is equal to MA and sometimes F is equal to MD. In other words, there is only forms of acceleration. There is no deceleration. I know that hurts. I know we like to use it all the time. You know, decelerate, I'm decelerating. That does not exist in physics. And the problem with it is, is that in your car, you have your brake pedal, and then you have your accelerator, your speeder upper. The problem with that is, is that it, it, it embeds false physics. Acceleration can mean to speed up, but acceleration can mean to slow down. So how do you describe it in physics? Direction. We have positive accelerations and negative accelerations. Now, I'm going to teach you in subsequent lectures that positive acceleration can actually mean to speed up or slow down. Negative can mean to speed up and slow down. But it's all forms of acceleration. So 
in layman's terms, what we don't do is we don't say in layman's terms, we don't say acceleration means to speed up, deceleration means to slow down. In layman's terms, you know what we say? Speed up, slow down. How simple is that? If I'm talking about an object getting faster, I'm going to say it's speeding up. And I'm going to infer that it's accelerating because everything takes time to speed up. And if I want to talk about an object slowing down, I'm going to say it's slowing down. Its velocity is getting less and less and less. Imagine you're in your car and you get to a red light and you slow down. That's what it takes time to slow down. But think about slamming on your brakes, changing your velocity in less time requires a greater acceleration, more force, slamming on the brakes, great acceleration, great force. Okay. So there's only accelerations, forms of accelerations, speeding up, slow down. We do not use the term deceleration in, in biomechanics and physics. Okay. That's going to be a test question. All right. Today, I'm going to keep lecturing, but today the code word for your lecture is completed with the dot, with the period. Completed, period, that period, because, man, I'm, I'm figure it out, man. It's, the students are smart, but we're trying to apply it to the school, not figuring out how to get around things. Some people figured out that if they just look in the comments, right, and they can see the word and type in the word. So I'm really testing you to see if you're really watching this. This is only going to help you. Don't help someone who's not watching these videos. Why would you do that? I want to help you. Completed with a period. Okay. All right. Let me write that down. So now we know our kinematic terms that you're going to need to know for this class, right? Things like position, where are you at? Change in position, where did you go? Change in position in regard to time, how fast did you move? That's velocity. Change in velocity in regard to time. How much time did it take you to speed up? Or how much time did it take you to slow down? So all of those things are kinematic terms. Now, let's work backwards. Acceleration, a kinematic vector term. Velocity, kinematic vector term. Speed, kinematic scalar term. Distance, kinematic scalar term. Displacement, kinematic vector term. Position, kinematic term. Now, there's no direction with where you at, so it's a scalar. But let's think about this for a second. And now deep thoughts. Position of what? What's position? Whatever object we're talking about, right? The runner chalk, the pencil, the ball, the position of what, whatever the object is. And guess what I told you? Everything with mass takes time to speed up. So the point is, the real leap for today's lecture is mass, stuff, is a kinematic term. That's cool. And it's going to be applicable when we get into Newton's laws on Friday. This ball has mass. And M, little m, is a kinematic variable. It's a motion variable. Okay? Now, you could say, well, why isn't it a force variable? Because remember what I said last class when, uh, last class when I was talking about forces? Objects cannot produce forces on themselves. This ball can only produce a force on other things. <laughs> this ball can push on my head. This ball can push on the computer. This ball can push on the bat. 
but the ball can't push on itself. It can't influence its own motion. Now, you may be like, well, Campbell, I could push on myself. Yeah, but you can't move yourself. In other words, if you were in free fall, if you were in orbit or free fall, you can't push on your head and make yourself move one way or the other. Because the push on your head this way is going to be canceled by the head pushing back on your hand that way, and they would cancel each other out. You wouldn't go anywhere. So mass stuff is a kinematic term. On the test, you're going to have to know what terms are kinetic force variables or kinematic motion variables, okay? Kinematic versus kinetic, right? So let's get into some Newton. Sir Isaac Newton, that dude was bright. He's so smart that they named a, 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 a sweet treat after him. It's a little Fig Newton joke for him. Oh, Isaac Newton, 17, mid-1700s. Let me look real quick. Uh, I should know this, but... I forgot. So let me check on my computer. Uh, because the ironic thing was that he was quarantined at a time for a plague. Yeah, he died in the early 1700s. Uh, so we're looking at probably, let's see, he was 26 when he uh, did calculus. So probably 1670s or so when he did. So let me tell you about Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton, uh, British, from England, and uh, he was what they called a, a natural philosopher. Um, those are what PhDs are now, right? He thought about things and, and did thought experiments and figured a lot of stuff out. Isaac Newton discovered a lot of stuff. You know, he has laws and stuff, but he discovered uh, optics. So like basically he discovered that if you take white light and you put it in a prism, it separates itself into different colors. Freaked out some of the artists of the day. You know, how do you put all the colors together and you get white light? Uh, he discovered laws of optics. He, as a basically a dare, I say a dare, but a friend of his came and said, I, now Isaac was very like a, uh, secluded like he didn't go to parties he never got married he just do just wanted to think and figure stuff out and so now people knew he was real bright right but he was just kind of so socially different so a friend of his went to him with a problem and he said isaac or i don't know maybe they had like hey ike why do planets now, back then, they knew this, right? But they knew it did it. They didn't. They couldn't explain the whys. A lot of things, it's about the whys. You know, when we talk about gravity, but back to the story. He said, why do planets travel around the sun in ellipses and not just circles, like curves, or like, like uh, going around a track? Why do they travel in elliptical orbits versus circular orbits? And Isaac was like, I don't know. Give me some time. I'll get back to you. So Isaac, now again, guys, think about it, man. What do you do? You didn't have deep thought. And I'm sure once a thought got in their head, it was hard to get it out. So I don't know how a couple months later, Newton calls his friend back to his a state and he's like here's why and I came out with this new branch of math to help explain it and that was calculus dude discovered calculus to answer a question <laughs> it was bright now one thing Newton was not it was ambitious he didn't 
answer these questions or give the, which is actually kind of cool. They say the greatest uh, motivation is intrinsic. You know, he didn't do it to be famous. He wanted to answer these questions. So a friend of his, I don't know if it was the same friend or not. Once his friend explained to him how it can help people, generations of people, the famous phrase, if I've seen further than anyone, it's because I was standing on the shoulder of giants. Meaning that when we add to the literature, answering this question helps set the foundation for someone answering the next question. So Newton wrote a book called Principia. And it really was, you know, that's where uh, he describes motion. His laws of motion are in there. He describes the effects of gravity, uh, how the moon is in a free fall. He, it's really, really cool, man. I'll, I'll do some, some, some diagrams of some of the things in his book. But So when we talk about Newton's laws of motion, that's where this came from is from his book now newton didn't call them laws dude wasn't like you know these are laws but they were observations to him that we over time because they were testable and retestable retestable in our world um we call them laws but you know we sent a man on the moon with nothing more than newton's equations of of, of motion and forces relationships okay the key thing with newton's laws is that it's not just about motion. It's about relationships between cause and effect. The causes being the kinetics, the forces, and the effects being the motions, the kinematics. So the, the simplistic beauty of Newton's observations, or what we term as laws, is really the relationship between forces and motion. Anything that's moving had to have a reason that it's moving the way it's moving, if that makes sense. Any effects that you observe had to be because of causes. So these two concepts, kinetics and kinematics, are related. I'm going to explain to that on Friday's lecture. But they are married concepts. They, they, they affect each other. Okay, Forces and motion. So... Although we call Newton's three laws of motion, it's really more than that. It's uh, laws of uh, forces and motion. What I'm going to do is I'm going to briefly talk about Newton's three laws here, uh, and then I'll go into more depth on what makes sense of them. So in other words, I'll introduce them to you today, and then I'll develop them for you guys on Friday, and then we'll move on to some different applications of Newton's laws. The first law, I said everything starts with P, position, right? That's where everything starts. What's the position? Position of what? Whatever object we're going to analyze or talk about. Well, what does that object have? Stuff. Mass. Stuff. So Newton's first observation was that all objects that have mass have a property and that is inertia, okay, I, little i. In school or physics, you might have learned the long definition of inertia. Uh, objects in rest, stay at rest. Objects in motion, stay at motion. We could simplify that. Objects can't move themselves. And objects resist change in their motion from other objects. Remember, this baseball can't influence its own motion. Other things have to come gravity, the push from my hand. And what Newton observed is that the more stuff you have, the more you're going to resist changes to your motion, which is another way of saying you're going to resist acceleration, right? Remember how we can infer that? So think of it like a few examples of this. Offensive linemen, big people or little people, don't they have to resist change to their motion? They don't want to be accelerated backwards. They tend to be big people, unless we're in Delcom, and they're small people, but that's just because we have small people. Linemen need to be big. Sumo wrestlers need to be big because they want to resist change in their motion. Think of another way. If uh, you have a car full of people and you run out of gas and you need to push the car, you're going to decrease the mass by making everybody get out of the car to make it easier to influence its motion, right, when you push it. 
easier to accelerate. So that's an observation Newton had, man. That was pretty cool. And now to us, that's like, duh, that's common sense, you know, Newton. But dude, back in the late 1600s, you know, that's, oh man, that's some new stuff. We're way over here now because we were able to piggyback on all the stuff people like Newton did. But back then, bro, they didn't really understand these kind of things. So inertia, that's Newton's first law. It is a kinematic law. It's a motion law. It's a motion law because remember, stuff has mass. Mass is kinematic. Mass is really the only thing that an object truly owns. It's position. It's stuff, okay? You own, just like you own your stuff, this ball owns its stuff, okay? So one way I learn or I remember inertia is that the I, number one, right? First law, inertia. Now, inertia falls in to Newton's second law because Newton's second law is a relationship, an equation. That is the famous Oh, got to put that vector sign. That's the famous F is equal to MA. Now, this little squiggly is sum. That means the sum of all. That means, hey, forces, vectors, we got to add up. We got we to gotta balance the checkbook in the X or the Y because there may be multiple forces, multiple influences trying to make this baseball do stuff. So it's the sum of all those. It's the remainder. It's the leftover that's truly going to determine whether that baseball accelerates or not. So the sum of all the different forces in either the X or the Y is directly proportional to the stuff, inertia, mass. See how Newton's first law drops into Newton's second law right there, times the potential for that object's acceleration. Forces, motion, kinetic, kinematic, force variables, motion variables. So Newton's first law drops right in there drops right into there because if you think about it it's the next logical question if newton said objects don't influence themselves then you can ask yourself okay that's cool so then what's influencing them what's making them accelerate what's making them change position over time what's making them change velocity all that stuff infers the same thing other objects, other outside objects must be applying forces to that baseball in order to influence that baseball's motion. Things on the other side of the fence of that baseball, the bat, planet Earth, gloves, grass, ground, other objects outside of that baseball are directly proportional to changing that baseball's motion. So Newton's second law, that's what Newton's second law is, is the obvious follow-up to Newton's first law. Objects have stuff, stuff resists motion, but the stuff in that object can't influence its own motion. Well, then what can? Other objects can. Other objects that have force on the object we're analyzing can change their motion. Outside objects can influence motion through their force. Use the force, Luke. <sighs> so that's a, a introduction to Newton's second law. Alum in Lord of the Rings, his motion capture software, Hollywood, he's won Academy Awards, but the nicest humble guy. He's like, all I do is apply Newton's second law in everything I do. And it's like, because it has everything. It's the ultimate relationship between cause and effect. Okay. Well, if second law is the ultimate relationship of everything, why do we have a third law? Once again, that Newton, he's like, well, if this baseball is, if this baseball's motion is being influenced by outside stuff, really Newton's second law is only looking at things from one object's perspective. Think of it as counseling. You have singles counseling. Hey, Hey, baseball, tell me about your mother. Hey, baseball, what do you feel? Tell me about your feelings. Newton's second law 
is selfish in that it's only one object at a time. What does the baseball feel from the bat? But I could apply Newton's second law to the bat. What does the bat feel from the baseball? So what Newton realized was is that if I'm applying Newton's second law to this ball, every force that the ball feels from other things, those other things must feel the ball back. Newton's third law. You know how we action, reaction? There's no action. It's force, counterforce. Newton's third law is a kinetic law. Every force an object feels, the, there must be another object that feels that force back. Think of it like this. If you're not touching the table, it's not touching you back. As soon as you touch the table, it's touching you back. As soon as the table feels you, you feel the table. Now, those are two separate objects. So Newton's third law is, hey, those objects must feel each other with the same exact amount of force, but in opposite direction. It's a force law. Um, I'll end this lecture with this story. When my son was young, uh, he was having some nightmares about ghosts, you know, kids, and you have an active imagination. And uh, I said, well, Trayson, why are you afraid of ghosts? He's like, well, I don't want them to get me. I was like, but just lock your door. He's like, Dad, the ghost can go through the door, silly pants. And I was like, well, if they can go through the door, then you have nothing to worry about because then they're going to go through you and then they can't mess with you. And they're like, Dad, that's not how ghosts work. The ghost can go through the wall, but they can get you. And I was like, well, okay, well, when the ghost grabs you, just punch it in its ghost nose and it's going to leave you alone. It's going to respect you for standing up to it. He's like, no, Dad, ghosts can't go. You go through the ghost, but the ghost can get you. I said, Trace, and that's impossible. It's impossible for the ghost to physically touch you and you not touch him back. It's impossible. How can, how can the ghost touch you and you not touch him back? If you touch me on the shoulder, my shoulder is touching you back. And he was just like, dude, can I have like a glass of apple juice or something, man? That's Newton's third law. Newton's third law is action, reaction with forces, force, counter force. If the ground feels you pushing down on it, you feel the ground pushing up on it. If you feel friction from the ground, the ground feels friction from you. If my cheek feels a push from a fist this way, the fist feels a push from my cheek that way, and they feel the exact same amount of force in opposite directions. Think of it like this. If you write a check for $200, assuming there's no error, it's impossible for you to lose 200 without whoever you wrote that check to to gain 200 Okay. Same magnitude, opposite direction. Okay, That's what Newton's third law is, force, counterforce. It's impossible for you to feel anything, even gravity, even non-contact, meaning that let's say this is planet Earth and this is you, and you feel a 200-pound, I feel a 200-pound force going down to Earth, in the center of the earth, there's a little 200 pound up arrow. My body is pulling up on planet earth. Now, planet earth is pretty big. So that 200 pounds really isn't very significant. It's like a little microbe. You don't feel the microbe on your hand because it's so small, but it's there. It's there. Force counter force, right? All right, guys, uh, you guys have a great day. And don't forget uh, the password is completed with a period. You better add that period for it to count. Later. Hello, secret camera.